Hello, my name is Zahn Eastis. I'm the founder and music director of the Juno Orchestra Project. We're very excited to be bringing to you today, and so glad you're here, to check out this new project we have, which is called Juno Singles. Juno Singles is a four-part project. Uh, the first part we're calling Creation. Juno Orchestra has commissioned local composers to write a 10 or 15 minute piece for the string section of Juno. The next part, which we're calling interpretation, is that Juno Orchestra will workshop each of these pieces. Each piece will be performed and recorded, and then we're gonna to put together a little documentary of each of the composers and a performance of the piece, so you can enjoy this work that we're also enjoying. The third part of this project, we're very excited to be collaborating with Nimble Arts they will be providing for us a response to each of the audio recordings. So in addition to four performance videos from Juno Orchestra, you have an opportunity to see four videos by Nimble Arts that are in response to the music. So we have creation, interpretation, and response. Once we're all done with this pandemic and we can actually get everyone together again, we look forward to an opportunity where we'll take all four of these pieces, put them together in one concert, and engage with, again, Nimble Arts. So watch for announcements about that. But for now, we'll take a few moments to hear from Eugene Newman, the director of the Vermont Jazz Center. Eugene has written a piece for Juno Orchestra called The Struggle for Optimism Suite. Eugene will talk about the piece a little bit, tell us a little bit about his work, and then Juno Orchestra will perform the piece for you. Thank you very much. My parents were encouraging to all of us siblings, or four of us, to take lessons, which we did. I loved playing the piano, and I started taking lessons at age six. I was in fourth grade. I learned how to play the blues. And that was something that really made a huge impact on me. I had a real legit jazz teacher when I was in about mm, maybe uh, 11th grade, Erwin Stahl, who was a fantastic uh, teacher who really taught me about harmony. But then I did forestry for like 10 years and I was based in, in East Bethel, Vermont. And I played a lot in Burlington. I was a member of the Vermont Jazz Ensemble. And I was uh, playing at a jam session and Howard Brosky came by and he heard me play and said, hey, what are you doing around here? I think you should come to New York with me. And I'm like, oh, thanks, I got, I got my job. I'm feeling pretty comfortable. I got a nice house. And he told me that I could go to Queens College as a graduate student without an undergraduate degree in music. And so Howard Brosky is really, uh, he became my mentor. You know, he is somebody who showed me the ropes of what it was really like to take jazz seriously. And I went eventually to Queens College and got my degree in jazz performance with him as my mentor. And at the time, Jimmy Heath was there, the great saxophone player. He's another mentor of mine. I got to study with him and that was a real honor. Uh, another person who was at Queens College at the time uh, was Donald Byrd, the great trumpeter, and uh, Sir Roland Hanna was one of my piano teachers. They all impacted me in different ways. And then when I graduated from Queens College, I stayed in New York for a while, and I studied with Mike Longo, who is a piano player who played with Dizzy Gillespie for many years. And Mike Longo was the first teacher I had who really codified things. He was a person who really understood the way that voice leading was one of the critical parts of the jazz language, and he taught in that manner. And it's something that I've actually adopted. So I lived in Columbia for many years. Uh, for three, The first time was three years. They were really thirsty for jazz instruction. And so as somebody who had just finished graduate school and was eager to teach, it was a bonanza for me. So I first became a teacher and a performer. I got to tour the country. I got to hook up with this wonderful saxophone player uh, who performed with the original group called Ira Carey. Um, 
His name is, was Carlos Aberhoff, and I got to tour with him, a phenomenal saxophone player. And while I was in Colombia, I was also exposed to the Colombian rhythms. I became a producer of a percussion project, which was never released, but I still have it. It's, it's phenomenal. And when I came back to the States, I studied that in earnest. And so I had this whole, you know, this grouping of Colombian rhythms. And then I could like slow them down and interpret them and transcribe them. And I started to use those as the basis for a bunch of my own compositions. And that was the, the send off to the Convergence Project, which is my personal group that includes a cachet of Colombian tunes that I don't want to call them Colombian tunes because they're not really appropriating the Colombian forms. They're using the Colombian rhythms and putting, overlaying them with jazz harmony and jazz inflection and jazz language. So that was that those recordings became the first doorway to that. And then playing in a group like the Convergence Project, at first it was with two musicians, Tomu Takaishi and Satoshi Takaishi, who um, Satoshi had lived in, in um, Bogota for five years and was one of the finest Colombian drummers, even though he's Japanese, he really became an expert at all these different Colombian rhythms. And his brother Stomu also became fascinated with that. So they, they formed this rhythm section, which really understood that music. And in playing with these masters of that music in my group, I became to, uh, more familiar with it and more comfortable with it. And I continue to utilize those rhythms somewhat in, in my compositions these days. It's more natural now that I, when I do play music that I still feel internally now those Colombian rhythms as well as Afro-Cuban rhythms are part of my vocabulary. Because I'm the director of the Vermont Jazz Center, I, I'm a curator of other musicians, you know, of putting together programs that include a, a curation of a season. So I'm always listening to different artists and trying to figure out where they fit in so that I can have a balanced season. That really affects my own composition because I feel that I need to listen from a judgmental point of view to other artists so that I can then fit them into a season that starts somewhere and then kind of has some connection. So because I'm always listening to music from a critical point of view, I'm quite self-critical about my own playing and my own compositions. So I feel that the, the composition process is something that happens really slowly now. It used to be something that would happen immediately. And now uh, I've just become really uh, slow about it. And I don't mind. It's something that happens over time. And so I feel like music has definitely kind of gotten to this point where it becomes a reflection of what I've been thinking about. I haven't been writing a whole lot of pieces, but when I do, they seem to be more kind of like episodic, these long things rather than these like one page tunes that I can say, hey, let's play this. <laughs> Another thing that has, I've been writing for has been the Latin Jazz Ensemble at the Vermont Jazz Center. I run that with a wonderful percussionist named Julian Gersten. We do like four or five different tunes a semester that we write for whatever group is present. So that gives me the opportunity to kind of um, fine tune some of the work I do. Writing for Juno has been a game changer for me. I now see what the possibilities of writing for an orchestra are, or at least for a string orchestra. And it's almost as if I've been waiting all my life to do something like this. It's really fun. Writing for my group, which is usually a sextet, three horns, and then the rhythm section, you're limited by the number of voices that you can use. But for a string orchestra, you can do these very fat chords with lots of voices. You can do divisi so that all of a sudden you've got, you know, seven note chords. And as a pianist, that's something that I, I already play. So how can I then translate that into an, an orchestra or an ensemble outside of me 
that speaks the language that I'm hearing in my head in a way that takes it to a different level. I did some serious studying to find out what the vocabulary was of the string instruments themselves, but I found out that there was a sense of flexibility that I'd never experienced before. That was really liberating, and it allowed me to write things that were more complicated and uh, rich than I've ever experienced. I felt like because of this opportunity, I was able to manifest a dream that I'm feeling is really exciting.